Welcome, everyone. Um, we're really thrilled that you can be joining us um, this afternoon or morning or evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, my name is Sky Flanagan. I'm from the Center for Climate Health and the Global Environment at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And we are thrilled to be joining Putney Student Travel um, today to be talking about our youth summits on climate equity and health that are happening this July in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, before we get started, just a housekeeping item. If you have questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A. We will have time at the end to answer those questions. My colleague Julian um, is here. He will be answering questions uh, at the end from the Putney perspective um, and throughout the webinar. So feel free to put them in there. And if it's something that is relevant to the whole group, we will probably wait to the end to answer them um, as we want to make sure everyone has the information they have need. Um, so before we get started, just do a little bit of a rundown of what we've got on the agenda for today. Um, first, we're going to hear from former Governor Peter Shumlin, um, who's also the co-director of Putney Student Travel, about the creation of this program, um, gives a little bit of context of where we're at. Um, next, uh, we'll go through um, a little bit more about our center at Harvard and talk through some of the speakers who you can expect to see this summer and the expertise that they bring to the program. Then we're going to hear from Alex, Alex Babasa, excuse me, Basaraba, um, uh, who was one of our fantastic instructors from last summer. And he is going to give you an on the ground perspective of what you can expect from the day, from the week. Um, really excited that he's joining us today. Um, our director from the Center for Climate Health and the Global Environment, Dr. Ari Bernstein is going to join us, um, hopefully around the midpoint of the webinar um, to talk about what he thinks is really unique about the program, what he's looking forward to for the summer. Um, I will then run through a few more of the logistics, um, things that you should know um, about the program, and then um, we will open it up for some Q&A. Um, and so, with that, I'm really excited to pass it over to Governor Shumlin um, to talk more about the creation of the program and set the tone. Thank you so much, Sky Flanagan, and I'm delighted to be with all of you and delighted to be a part of this effort. I thought I might just start out by telling you a little bit about uh, the history of this program, how it got started, and why I'm so excited to be a part of this really important effort. Uh, so just to give you a very brief history to warm us up a little bit, and I'm sorry I'm kind of in the dark here. The sun's out in the Green Mountain State of Vermont, and I, my, I'm filled with windows around me. So uh, hopefully the sun will start to go down, and, and you, you might be able to see me better. That's not necessarily a good thing. But anyway, I just want to, uh, so I ran for governor. I served three terms as governor of Vermont. Uh, and this, just a little bit about the history of how this program got started. When I ran for governor, it was the bottom of the recession. Uh, think President Obama running against John McCain for president. That was the time of, uh, of our history. And we were in a worldwide recession. Every evening was talking about jobs. And I was in a Democratic primary for governor and then obviously a general election talking about jobs. And I won't go through the whole platform here, but one thing I said to Vermonters is, listen, if you elect me governor, one thing we're going to do to create jobs is we're going to go after renewable energy, energy efficiency, like no other state. My belief is that it's cheaper, frankly, to do renewables, energy efficiency, than to bring in oil and gas and other fossil fuels from countries, mostly that don't like us, and that we'll put money in Vermonters' pockets. It'll reduce electric rates. It'll create jobs. And we can show the world how one little state can make some contribution to the biggest challenge of our time, climate change. Anyway, long and short of it is, my Republican opponent said what we would expect. Climate change is not really true. He's gonna cost you jobs. It's gonna be more expensive, so on and so forth. Bottom line, after three terms as governor, Vermont was the number one solar state in America. We had uh, created thousands and thousands of jobs. Today, if you have 17 Vermonters in a room, one of them works in the renewable energy business. Uh, we uh, increased our wind power 
by 22 times, our solar power by 11 times, and we moved our state towards the goal of 90% renewable by 2050, which is probably moving too slowly, but that was the goal. Anyway, I tell you all this only because we also needed to clean up Lake Champlain, which is our great lake in Vermont. And it was having the same challenge as so many waterways are with climate change, rising temperatures, algae, real pollution issues. The head of the EPA at the time was a terrific person and now a close friend of mine named Gene McCarthy. And we worked with the EPA to help put a really aggressive plan together to clean up Lake Champlain. Anyway, all of the rest ensued. California wildfires, other governors were dealing with the same kinds of challenges. You can hit the next slide. And um, long and short of it is, Gina and I worked very closely together to solve some of the big challenges. When Gina, when the Obama administration came to an end, Gina McCarthy was engaged by Harvard and Harvard Sea Change at the School of Public Health, unbeknownst to me, to help head up their climate change efforts at Harvard, both externally and internally. And in the process, did an extraordinary job with helping to invigorate sea change at the School of Public Health. I had the privilege of doing some, uh, being a fellow at the Kennedy School that you've all heard of at Harvard. And then the School of Public Health asked me to go over there and be a fellow there, a teaching fellow, which I did. I got there and there was Gina McCarthy. And we were really happy to be together again. She was doing an extraordinary job. And I only tell you all this because it's how the program formed. One day we were having a conversation. And historically, this is the time when High school students were marching out of school on Fridays with Friday strikes. It was right before COVID a couple of years ago. Greta was about to come across and give the speech to the UN about the challenges we're all facing. And Gina is the most, I think, Sky, and I know Ari Bernstein will be on later, Dr. Bernstein and others would agree. She's the most get it done, straightforward, innovative leader that I've worked with uh, in my many encounters with so many people in government. Anyway. She said to me, Peter, isn't it kind of interesting that Harvard is using all the resources that she should at sea change around climate for undergraduates and graduate students, but all the action is coming from the middle and high school students. They're walking out of school on Friday. Greta's giving them hell at the UN this week, and so on and so forth. And she said, doesn't Putney work with high school kids? And I said, yeah. And so anyway, long and short of it was, she said with her fantastic Boston accent, we're gonna take all the resources we can here at Sea Change at the School of Public Health. We're gonna get the, the medical school, get everyone together and give these students the resources they need to not only understand the science, not only understand the challenge, not only stand at, understand activism and entrepreneurship and all the opportunities, but to give them the space with extraordinary resources to be able to put together plans for action so that they can take their frustration from walking out of school on Friday to real formative action because they are the most important thing to saving this planet from ourselves to our future. Anyway, Putney was delighted to join this effort uh, and having this collaboration with Harvard and Sea Change and these summits is tremendous. It happened last summer, the first one, it was an extraordinary success. And what I say as a former governor, as well as a colleague and friend of Sea Change, is this is where the action is. This is where the rubber hits the road. If you want to have a summer experience, a short one, where you're going to be with an empowered group of students who share your values, but are desperate to know more, learn more, and make this a part of their future before our future is unlivable, this is the place that you want to be. So I'm super grateful to Gina McCarthy, who, as you know, is probably, you probably know, is now Biden's, I call her the, the uh, climate change czar of America. She's behind much of the proposals that they're trying so hard to develop and get done in Washington. But she's very much in spirit, still a part of this program. She's really the reason that it's happening. And I'm extraordinarily grateful to her. So by way of introduction, I look forward to being there this summer. I hope you will join us. It's truly a one-of-a-kind program that gives high school students the resources, the exposure, the 
access to people that are doing amazing things to help meet this challenge, which we all see as sea chains and Putney as an opportunity, not as something to be dreaded. But we've got to move a lot faster and high school students, young people are our only hope. You're it and we hope you'll join us. Thanks so much. I'm gonna turn my camera off, but I'm gonna come back during question and answers because you're gonna hear from uh, a lot of the folks uh, who are really making this program happen. So thank you so much for being with us today. Happy to answer questions anytime. You can call me here at the Putney office. I love talking about this program if you have individual questions and take it away, Scott. Thank you so much, Governor Shumlin. Um, you know, I, I love to hear that story. And I remember fondly of the time that Gina came over and said, we're going to run this program because I really was super, super inspired by the youth um, and the action that I saw. Um, and I, as someone that has been in the environmental world a long time, um, I'm really excited that people are energized by this. Um, so I wanted to just take a couple of minutes to give you an overview of our center and talk through some of the speakers that you might um, hear from this summer to give you a taste of what kind of guest speakers we have on the program. Um, Alex will then go on and tell you a little bit more about the day to day. Um, but to start, um, we are the Center for Climate Health and the Global Environment. As I mentioned, we, we sit at the Harvard School of Public Health. So we're a center-wide school. We, we work with our nutrition department, our infectious disease department, um, all of our various departments at the School of Public Health. And our mission is to increase the public's awareness of the health impacts of climate change. So it's personal, urgent, and actionable. We really want people to understand that climate isn't about polar bears and far off places while we love them. It's really about our, our families, our personal health, our community health, and we need to take action and we all can play a role in that. Um, so we are currently led by Dr. Ari Bernstein. He is our interim director and he is a pediatrician from Boston Children's Hospital. Um, we'll hopefully hear more from Ari in a few minutes, um, but we uh, were formally directed by Gina McCarthy who really set our, our mission and our tone for the work that we do. Um, we do research. Uh, we do research on a lot of various um, oil, natural gas, um, health impacts of you know transportation, um, a, a number of really um, interesting climate resiliency projects. Um, we also translate science. So we spend a lot of our time digesting um, the complex climate science that's coming out of the school, school of Public Health, Harvard and beyond. And make it relevant. So we, you know, we put it in front of media. We make sure that it's digestible. And like I said, we want to make sure that everything we do, people feel empowered to take action on. So, you know, we focus a lot on solutions and making sure that people understand that climate solutions are good for our health. They're pandemic solutions. Um, it's really, it's really an important uh, thread that we we try to tie together. Um, so we are a small but mighty center. As I mentioned, we actually have been around for 25 years. We started off at the medical school and we uh, were one of the first centers to raise the red flag that climate was going to be impacting health. And you know, you can think of the air pollution from the wildfires this past summer. Um, what better way to hit home than to see it right in your face? Um, but we, we do try to focus on solutions and we, we like to you know, make sure that people feel in, empowered. So I wanted to go run through a couple of the speakers that um, you can expect to see from um, like here from this summer. Uh, as I mentioned, Dr. Ari Bernstein, um, he will be around for a lot of the week. He is, you know, will be speaking with the students, also very available to just have one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, he's very much an expert on climate and health, has been working at this intersection for a long time. And, um, is we're really grateful that he is uh, very committed to, to being with us during the week. Um, Dr. Gora Basu is a physician and he's our climate and equity fellow. Um, he's a, a professor at the medical school and um, is really uh, one of the forefront leaders in thinking through uh, how climate is impacting equity and, and um, making sure that people understand that frontline communities are impacted. 
Uh, Jerome Foster the second is uh, an amazing environmental activist, voting right advocate, emerging technology engineer. He sits on President Biden's um, White House Environmental Justice Council and is just such a fantastic addition. Um, we hope that he joins us again this next summer. Uh, Francesca Dominici is one of the top scientists in the world. She's rate, ranked 1% uh, in her field um, and she studies air pollution. Uh, she also co-directs the Data Science Center at Harvard University. Um, and so she's just a fantastic wealth of knowledge. We're grateful that she's joining us. Marcia Castro, Dr. Marcia Castro is the chair of our Global Health and Populations Department at Harvard and is uh, one of the foremost leaders on infectious diseases, specifically around malaria, but she can talk to you on any of the, any various subjects related to it. Really interesting um, perspective uh, for Brazilian scientist. Uh, Dr. Howard Frumkin was the former dean of the University of Washington School of Public Health. So he has a lot of knowledge around public health. And he's currently the senior vice president for the Trust for Public Land. Um, he was the director of the National Center for Environmental Health at the CDC and also comes to us with a lot of experience. Dr. Howard Coe is um, one of one of the most fantastic people. He uh, was the Assistant Secretary uh, for Health and Human Services under the Obama administration and now is a professor of public practice at the School of Public Health and at the Harvard Kennedy School. And um, he is a really uh, exciting person to hear from in his work on various government levels and um, as and now as a, a practitioner um, of public health at our school. Uh, we have Dr. Renee Salas, who I would argue is the foremost leader um, of raising awareness around clinicians about what role they play in um, the climate change conversations. So she's really raising awareness around doctors raising their hands and educating their, um, their, their patients of how climate change will be impacting them. And so we're really excited. And Renee is one of our fellows at our center as well. And She's a fantastic um, speaker and always excited to help the students. Um, Nadia Nazar, who uh, joined us last summer, hopefully will be back this summer as well, is uh, the founder and co-executive director of Zero Hour, which if you don't know Zero Hour, um, they are one of the foremost leaders in the youth climate um, movement. And she uh, really had a great time last summer connecting with the students and inspiring them to take action in their community. Um, and we're really excited that she had um, a wonderful time last summer. We hope she'll join us again this summer. Uh, Natalia Linos is um, the co-director, or excuse me, the executive director of the FXB Center for Human Rights at Harvard. We have Jeff Nesbitt, who is probably one of the most influential people in the climate communication space that you haven't heard of because he's 100% behind the scenes, but he runs a nonprofit uh, communication organization that works on climate and er clean energy and solution issue, uh, and solutions. So, um, and then of course we have Peter Shumlin who you've heard from already, um, but these are just a, a taste for the one of some of the speakers that we, we will have this summer and um, I wanted to mention two others because um, while we have guest lectures in the classroom, we also want to make sure that they are interactive and get out into the community. Um, one of the activities that will happen again this summer is um, being led by Jeff Sanchez, who's pictured here in this photo. He's a former repre um, representative for the Massachusetts House of uh, representatives, excuse me, former member of the House of Massachusetts House of Representatives. And he's also a local of the area where we will be housed. So he can tell you all about the community in which we will be spending our time and the complex history that it has with the city of Boston, with the policies, with the environmental justice issues. He is um, very fun and we have a really good time walking around the neighborhood, getting to know the history and how policies have impacted 
that community. Additionally, Boston is known for its biotech um, industry. And so, you know, we have a, a workshop with um, Biogen, which um, here pictured here is Erin O'Brien, who's a, their director of process engineering groups there. So she led an interactive workshop talking all about how the pharmaceutical industry is utilizing green chemistry to evolve its practices. And um, it's a really fun and interactive way to get your a hands-on experience with that industry. Um, so with that, I know it's a lot of information, but I'm gonna pass it on to my friend, Alex, who is um, one of our fantastic instructors. And I'm really grateful that he's able to join us today to give you an on the ground experience, um, taste of what, we, what we, we do throughout the week. Thanks so much, Sky, and thank you, Governor Shevlin and, and Julian and Rebecca and, and Dr. Ari Bernstein for having me here today. It's great to be here with you all. Uh, as Sky mentioned, my name is Alex Basaraba. Um, I'm based out of Fort Collins, Colorado, and I'm a climate change resilience specialist by day when I'm not supporting Putney and, and the center programs. I'm also a photographer and educator, and uh, I've worked on some semblance of Putney's program since 2018. Um, in a variety of programs and last year uh, was lucky enough to get to teach the Harvard program and instruct the climate communications press and media focus group. So I'm here just to talk to you all briefly uh, about, you know, what the general day to day and week looks like, um, you know, to talk to you a little bit about some of the highlights that, that I experienced uh, from last year and uh, some of the work that we've seen from our students post summit. So I'll start with just the general, you know, what does a what does a general day and, and week look like? Um, so Sky's going to be covering the action focus groups and community action focus plans a little bit more depth uh, later, but um, that really sort of frames how we understand and, and structure the general days of your work uh, and time with us. So there is no question that it is a packed week. Uh, every day is different. Uh, includes a variety of activities and workshops and excursions. Um, some activities were go are going to be done as a smaller focus group pod, and some will be done uh, in partnership with other pods. And sometimes, uh, you know, we'll be experiencing or going to lectures as a full group. Um, so, as you know, like I mentioned, the the week is generally themed based on your actual focus group, and it's going to be geared towards uh, us as instructors and, and the, the support staff, being able to provide you all with the tools, the resources and experiences that you need to be inspired to take your work to the next level in this space. Um, like I said, I taught the Climate Communications Press and Media Focus Group. And so we were focused on you know, things like uh, principles of good climate communication, uh, how mainstream and out alternative news outlets narrate stories of climate change, you know, what are the responsibilities of the media in this space? So often our conversations were focused uh, on those particular topics. Uh, our individual lectures and our individual um, guest speakers were focused on some of these topics. Like Sky mentioned, we had an opportunity to talk with Jeff Nesbitt last year um, to hear about the ins and outs of what's climate communication look like in this space today? What should it be looking like? And how can we continue to, to influence that space in our own individual ways? Um, we often start breakfast together in the morning and have several meals together. Um, there are often two to three workshops throughout the day, um, whether that's in our own individual pod or with our guest lectures, the incredible guest lectures that we just heard from Sky about, uh, and then an excursion of some sort. Um, so we work hard, we have a lot of fun, uh, we make a lot of great new connections and built a lot of new friendships. I know uh, as an instructor, I certainly learned a lot, not only from the students, but from the incredible individuals that we have an opportunity to, to get to network with. So I'm just gonna move into some of the highlights from last year. Um, you know, first and foremost, it was amazing to get to watch all the students, you know, come into the space um, feeling maybe a little bit nervous, but excited about what the week and weeks were going to bring, um, but to really watch them, you know, burgeon into these incredibly inspired and and you know, reach into the amazing experiences that they've already had in their lives and to to relate to the incredible speakers that we have an opportunity to speak with and and flourish in this space and start to formulate this vision for how they want to to um, 
you know, address the climate crisis, not only in their own communities, but uh, globally in this global network. And so it was really special to get to watch those friendships form uh, in our in own individual pods and across the broader group. Um, it was amazing to get to see um, our students showcase their work and, and start to formulate this vision in a more powerful way. Uh, we had an opportunity uh, to, to spend some time, some quality time with Nadia Nazar, as, as Sky mentioned, um, and to get to watch, you know, we, we had an opportunity to spend a, a several days with her and to get to experience um, touring around the city itself and exploring the campus in Cambridge. Um, and watching our students, you know, get to ask Nadia questions about her own life and about her experience in this space as an activist and what it means to balance school and activism and um, the challenges in, in that day to day. So those are really where the, the, the valuable experiences happen. Um, one of the other highlights for me was, you know, again, just getting to learn from the incredible collective of uh, speakers and scientists, doctors, journalists, policymakers and climate activists. Uh, for our group specifically, we got to speak with uh, reporters from the Boston Globe Climate Desk, uh, the Weather Channel, you know, um, Jerome Foster again, who you've already heard about, uh, prominent climate activists supporting the Biden administration and their climate equity work. Um, we had an opportunity to spend time with Salvador Gomez Colon, who is named one of Time's most influential teams of 2017, and then of course, Drs. Bernstein and, and Garbasu uh, and the incredible staff at the center itself. Um, and then the last highlight I'm just going to um, talk about here is just our general excursions in the city. You know, we do work hard, we learn a lot, but we have a lot of fun as well. And so uh, for someone who's not from Boston, having an opportunity to explore the city um, through this, this climate lens was really special. We got to explore the Museum of Science and the aquarium and, and all then being able to link in those topics into how we're talking about climate change and how we understand and are working towards uh, solutions that address the climate crisis itself. Um, and so the last thing I'm just gonna touch on quickly before we introduce Dr. Bernstein here is um, some of, it's been really exciting to see our students um, come away from the summit feeling inspired, feeling more connected. You know, this work can feel lonely at times, right? It's it's a, a massive issue. It's it's the global issue of our time. And, and um, to know that there are other incredible individuals working across our own communities, across the world, um, doing this work day to day tirelessly is, is really inspiring. And so um, I really, experienced that through our students lens you know I've, I've had students publish pieces in reputable newspapers with interviews from some of our guest speakers that we've heard uh, that we heard from during the summit and following the summit you know establish relationships and mentorships with some of those individuals for example the Boston Globe Climate Desk um, I had a student from rural Montana that you know was was feeling pretty shy when she arrived at the program and, and nervous about being in the program, but, you know, really watched her flourish throughout the week. And she's followed up and, and publishing several pieces uh, is now I'm, I'm going to be helping support some of the work that she's doing in a green initiative in her own school and community, um, whether working towards sustainable solutions like, you know, how to develop a strategic plan for installing solar panels and, raising money for an electric school bus and, you know, planning Earth Day events and film festivals and all of these incredible things. So um, to watch this, this seed be planted and to flourish in a, in a really amazing way has been very special. So uh, again, it's been an honor to be here with you all and uh, look forward to seeing you all this coming year again. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna pass it back to Sky to introduce Dr. Bernstein. Thanks so much, Alex. Um, great overview of uh, an on the ground perspective. Um, I'm now gonna turn it over to our director, Dr. Ari Bernstein. Um, and I already mentioned that he's a pediatrician um, at Boston Children's Hospital and has been working in the space for a long time. But I would love Ari to give you um, some of his insights of you know, why he feels this program is unique and what he's excited about for this coming summer. Thanks, Ari. Thanks, Ty and Alex and Governor Shimlin. It's always a pleasure to spend time with you, even virtually. Uh, I couldn't uh, agree more with what I have been hearing about how uh, impressive the students we had to work with last summer were, what they have already accomplished, and uh, how excited working uh, in this program 
uh, how exciting working in this program is for me. You know, I, I teach a lot of students uh, all the time. Uh, it's part of my job. Um, everyone from college students at Harvard through doctoral students in various capacities and, and even professional education. But I, I can say without hesitation that the, the, the educational work I do that excites me most uh, based upon last year is, is, this, is this work, is, is work on the summits. And, and the reasons are clear. Uh, we know that uh, the youth climate movement has been the most important force in transforming action on climate change that we've seen in uh, maybe forever. Um, this is, uh, to my knowledge, the only event in the world that empowers youth climate leaders uh, and those who are passionate about the climate crisis to go to their communities uh, knowledgeable about the health and equity effects of climate change and, and especially climate actions that, that stand to really get at the health and equities that are at the root of so many of the problems we, we deal with, including what we're seeing with COVID. And so when I think about the things that I've, I've done in my career, I, I honestly think there are relatively few that would stand up uh, alongside of, of this one. Um, as Alex alluded to, it, it's just extraordinary to see young people from around the country work together and form networks that are critically important to buffering against what can feel like an overwhelming and, and otherwise in some cases isolating experience of trying to engage. So it, it's really wonderful in that regard, above and beyond the exchanges, which uh, I, I hope you all get to see, between the, the students and, and the faculty uh, that, that, that come and, and work with us. Um, I, I think that in, in many ways, as is so often true in education, uh, the people who are supposedly leading the sessions learn just as much uh, as those who are participating. And so I think the, uh, in, in talking to, uh, as an example, Howard Coe, who uh, was one of the presenters last year, he is the former Assistant Secretary of Health and Human Services in the Obama administration. He was Commissioner of Public Health uh, in, uh, for the state of Massachusetts. He's a professor of practice at the Harvard Chan School. And you know he spent his entire career working in public health, a large part of his career. And he was transformed by the experience. He really uh, was, I think, inspired to do more. Um, I think it gave him a perspective on the issues that he wouldn't have had. And I think this is another benefit to us all that, that when young people engage with people who are further out in their careers, um, it has benefits um, to, those, to those individuals as well. So I, I, I couldn't be more grateful for your interest. I really hope we get to see you uh, in Boston uh, this summer. I, as you know, am excited about it and, and hope to see you there. Thank you so much, Ari. Um, I, I really grateful joining us. I know this is, a, is a, a bit of a crazy week for a lot of us, but we are thrilled that you were able to join and give your perspective. Um, and I will echo what Ari said, you know, we have, we've been working with these faculty members for a long time and each one of them walked away feeling more inspired to do the work that they have been doing than ever before. So we're really grateful um, that we are able to foster those types of relationships and we're looking forward to doing more of that this summer. So um, now I just want to quickly run through a couple of the logistical aspects of the program. Um, we uh, are currently accepting students grades nine through 12. Um, the theme of this year is empowering young people to lead. Um, and we have two sessions. It will be July 17th through 23rd and July 24th through 30th. And so the way that that kind of breaks down is the students arrive on Sunday, we have a welcome. Um, and then Monday through Friday is intensive workshops, um, working with your action focus group, et cetera, excursions, uh, very much an action packed week. Uh, and, then on, and then on Saturday, the students depart. So um, 
this year we have uh, seven different action focus groups. And what is an action focus group? Um, I know you, Alex mentioned it, um, but it is the lens in which you will be looking at the issue through. So when you sign up and you enroll in the program, you select one of these action focus groups. And then when you get to um, Boston, you will meet up with that action focus group and that will be what you call your pod. And you'll have a leader like Alex um, leading you through a curriculum for that week. Um, and you'll hear from various guest speakers that are tailored to your action focus groups. Um, and uh, it's really the, an opportunity to look you know, more in depth at something that you um, are interested in. So if you're interested in policy and advocacy, um, you, know, you can choose that action focus group. So quickly, the various seven that we have, you can see on the screen, we have a climate communication press and media group. We have a science communication, or excuse me, sci climate science uh, action focus, the entrepreneurship industry and technology action focus, an environmental justice action focus, global health, epidemiology, and infectious disease action focus. We have a medicine and healthcare fo action focus. And then, as I mentioned, the policy and advocacy action focus. So you're gonna hear um, keynote speakers as the whole program together. Um, but again, we will have guest speakers who are specifically working on these issues um, tailored to your action focus group throughout the week so that you can really dive into a subject. And then throughout the week, um, one of the most important components that we feel is that what we you take home um, the knowledge and a plan back to your community um, of what you've learned here. Um, so everyone will come up with a community action plan. Um, you'll work on it throughout the week with your pod and you present in front of uh, either your pod or the whole group at the very end of the week. Um, you know, some students uh, presented last year on um, building a greenhouse on their school or implementing a solar program in their community. Um, others, you know, were going to be the head of their yearbook for the coming year. So they plan to put in climate change information into their yearbook. Um, it's really tailored to what your interests are and what works for your community. Um, but it's a really nice way to have um, a follow up plan beyond the week so that you continue your learning and your advent your um, adventure and experience being a climate activist. Um, so throughout the week, um, we do utilize the Harvard campus in some capacity. Um, COVID has made it a little bit more challenging than in normal years we would all of our classes are would be on campus, but we're still um, having to you know, sort through what that looks like for this coming summer. Um, but we will definitely be um, on the campus. Um, we're, our residence is across the street from the Harvard School of Public Health. It's called the Treehouse Residence in Boston. Um, but we, whether it's having a lunch on the Harvard Medical School quad or doing a tour of the Cambridge campus or checking out some of the museums, COVID permitting, uh, we definitely uh, utilize the Harvard campus. And one of the best components, I think, of the program is that we get to use Boston as our classroom. Um, Boston is a small but mighty and um, very influential city, um, uh, along with its plethora of universities. It also has a ton of biotech and pharmaceutical stuff happening. There's an incredible startup scene in Boston. Um, and so like Alex said, whether it be going to the aquarium or going and checking out the Natural History Museum, it's a really exciting week where you get to like know this city that just has so much happening and so much to offer. And then at the very end of the week, um, we have a celebration. Um, and last year we went out on a harbor cruise, um, which is a beautiful way to end the week. and. Um, we get to celebrate you all for really giving um, your input and teaching each other um, about what matters in climate equity and health. So um, the last thing I want to mention is that we um, have a scholarship available. 
and um, it is open and you can apply today. Um, currently, our deadline is March 15th, but we have lots more information about that on our website. Um, and with that, I want to thank all of my co-speakers, um, co-presenters, and um, all of you for joining. This has really um, been um, a nice opportunity to tell you about our program that we're really proud of. Um, and now I'm going to pass it off to Julian, who is going to run our Q&A. Hey, I just want to interrupt and say thank you, Sky. You did an amazing job, as you always do, in helping us all understand the program better. And uh, Alex, you were fantastic help. And thank you so much for being part of this program. And I just got to say, I don't know if Ari's still with us, but he's magic. And uh, watching him speak about this program with such enthusiasm uh, is really exciting. But he's the, he's the rock that moves the mountain. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. I'm going to jump in here. Hi, everybody. My name is Julian. I, I'm a program director at Putney Student Travel. Um, and as Sky mentioned before, you know, feel free to give Pete or me a call anytime if you want to talk about the program or ask any questions. Um, our, the application is pretty straightforward. It's an applicant statement, a couple of teacher references, and an agreement form, um, and a deposit to hold the space. And that's pretty much it. And so after that, we'll let you know if all looks good and you're accepted and we will share all kinds of awesome information with you to help you get ready for the program. Um, so I do have one question in the Q&A. If anybody else has questions, feel free to put them in there. Um, the question is, can, can a student attend both sessions and participate in a different focus for each week? And the answer is yes. Um, we would love to have students come for two sessions. If it's possible, you know, you're, you're welcome to come back and do a different focus. We also have a, a discount for students that do two sessions back to back of $1,000. So hopefully that um, will help, you know, it become more of, a, of an option for people. And we, yeah, we just spread the word, tell your friends, um, we're looking forward to running this next year. Anybody else have any questions? This year, excuse me. <laughs> Julian, maybe the only thing we haven't touched on, well, people enter any questions that I have is the admissions process, because that's often a bit of a mystery. Assuming that you wish to apply, you go to the website, obviously hit apply now, fill out the form, it's just basic information, you can do it, or frankly, your parents can, you know, a parent can do it, it's not, there's nothing magical for that part. Um, you then make a $700 deposit on Visa or MasterCard, and then we write, the admissions office will write back and say, yes, we have space, and yes, we have space, and the action focus we've chosen. If that all happens, then we ask students to provide us with the email addresses of two teachers or advisors that know them best at school. You write a short essay. And once we've compiled all that, we give you a decision. If you're in, it's all go. And if for some reason we think that you're not ready for the program, we credit your credit card, the $700. So that's the process. It's rolling admissions, uh, but for that reason, if it's something you're excited about, don't wait, get the process rolling while there's still space. And just to add on that, there's a question, can a student going into ninth grade next fall apply? So a student finishing eighth grade this summer? Um, and the answer is yes, we, we do accept motivated rising ninth graders um, for admission. So it's a little bit of a case by case basis, but if we think it's a good fit, uh, it's definitely a possibility. Also worth mentioning, we had a number of rising ninth graders last summer and they excelled in the program. So there's a precedent. Great, well, I think that's it for questions at the moment. If anybody, you know, oh, there's, there's housing, is there housing provided? Yes. Um, we take over some of the, Sky, do you actually, do you wanna talk about housing? Sure. Yeah, sure. So we, um, yes, everything, once you're on the ground of the program, everything is covered. So that's including your housing, your meals, any type of admission, anything that we're going to on an excursion, everything is covered once you're there. So you don't need to have any type of spending money um, per se to cover those kinds of things. And um, the dorm that we used last year and uh, plan to use again this summer is um, called the Treehouse Residency. It's part of um, Wentworth and Mass College of Art, which is right next door to our campus. And um, it's a great, very secure 
um, spread out uh, space. So it's it's really centralized um, and uh, it's it's very comfortable. I'll, I actually stay there as well. So um, <laughs> it's a, it's a it's a comfortable space for everyone to be a clean and well secure space. I think it's also just worth mentioning the what Sky just outlined. A lot of our teachers and all of our staff are living with the students in the dorm. So it isn't like going to college where, you know, seminar ends or lectures end or whatever, and you're kind of sitting around wondering, what do I do next? And, you know, blah, blah, blah. And a bunch of college kids are, you know, are RAs or whatever. Uh, Sky, uh, our directors, everyone are living uh, with the students and very much part of your lives. The other point to men mention that really maybe we haven't hit hard enough is this is a busy program. In other words, you're trying to pack a lot in to six or seven days. So bottom line is we get up in the morning, have breakfast, and we go at it. And it's not like you're sitting around in your dorm with your gadget in front of your face in the afternoon trying to figure out what to do. The question is, do you get enough time to get to your room and get a shower and get a little rest or whatever it is? It's really an active program, both afternoon, evenings. Uh, we're on the go all the time. Uh, the, the other thing I just want to make clear for folks that aren't really familiar with Harvard and Boston is, and I know we touched on this a bit, but this, what I love about the location of the School of Public Health, and don't forget, Harvard School of Public Health is a graduate program. So they don't have tons of housing because graduate students obviously get apartments and all that, they have lives. Uh, so uh, that's why, as Sky mentioned, we're using the residences of the Mass School of Art right in back of the School of Public Health, which shares a campus with the Harvard Medical School, the Dental School, and lots of other of the Harvard schools on that side of the river. I love that part of Harvard because, frankly, to me, being able to walk to the Isabel Gardner Museum, to be able to walk to Fenway Park, all the things that are right there, uh, it's really, uh, you know, a very vibrant part of Boston. And obviously, we get over to the Cambridge side and Harvard Square and all that, but I love uh, this particular location, and uh, I think you will too. All right, well, I think we're, uh, I don't see any other questions coming in. So if you have them, give us a call. We'd be happy to chat. Thank you for joining us. And uh, again, I know Julian mentioned this a second ago, but don't reach it. Don't feel, no, feel free to reach out to me, to Sky, uh, to Julian anytime. We're happy to answer individual questions that you wouldn't want to ask on a webinar. Thank you guys. Really appreciate it and hope to see you this summer.